morning. How's everyone doing? everybody this morning. Where are they all? I'm feeling good. How are you, Avery? Are you well? I'm hungry, <laughs> but I mean, you know, who's, who, who can be, uh, who can complain about that? I guess, you know, I, mean, I am hungry. Hungry. But that's par for the course, am I right? Par for the course. Tiny human in my belly wants food. She wants to eat a thing. And that's okay. I'll let her eat a thing. Well, not too. Hey, uh, these bars that Shira made me are just so delicious. I dream about them when I'm laying in bed before I get up in the morning. I'm like, ma'am, they're so good. Morning. They're just so delicious. So delicious. And nutritious. Literally both. So, you know, hard to complain. Oh. Oh, thank you. You know, it's actually the light. <laughs> it's very bright today, but I appreciate the compliment anyway. Shira made them for me. They're so good. Yummy, yummy, yummy. They have Shira's homemade cashew butter in them. Cashews dates, some different fruit, black seed, and oats. Yeah, we are. Oh no. We are. They are, they're really good. I know she said some other like almonds are in here. Um, I think cranberries maybe. Um, or maybe it's cherries. Might be cherries. Yeah, Hydra cats and dogs, you guys. Um, they just kind of, um, oh, I thought the movie was super cute. I thought it was super cute. Have you seen it? We saw it this past weekend. Mm. You know what's weird? About this whole cat and dog thing, you guys. I'll be real with you for a second. 
We gotta talk about the cat and dog thing that Liz brought up. Do people not remember that this was like a racist rumor from the 90s? Do people not remember that? Because I very much remember it from my childhood. And it's like he went and found all of the weirdest conspiracies from previous decades and was just like, I'm just gonna pick one of them and say it. And the thing that's crazy is that I actually talked to the younger members of our family, like the Gen Z members of our family, and they didn't know that it had been a rumor in the 90s. So I think he was banking that either people wouldn't remember or they wouldn't have heard about it, but it was a totally a thing here in California in the 90s. And it's obviously false, you know? Like, we know it's not real. But it wasn't real then either. But it's absolutely something that my very racist, very Republican stepfather used to say in the 90s. When we lived in Irvine, which is an area with a very heavy Asian population. So... It's not like it's a new... He stole this rumor. He didn't even make it up himself. He couldn't even make up his own false facts. I'm glad the moderator was like, oh, that's not credible. Yeah, no, it's, of course it's not credible. It wasn't credible then, it's not credible now. It's, it's never been credible. It, it was, it wasn't real in the 90s either. Yeah, insane asylum is asylum speaker. Yes, that too, that was also very funny. But like, it, it was, it was crazy. I was like, bro, what are you talking about? It wasn't true when I was five and it's not true now either. He just changed which immigrant population he's talking about. In the 90s, it was Asians, and now it's Haitians. Pick one. Who's really eating the cats, you guys? Is it the Asians or is it the Haitians? I guess we'll never know. These are so good. It doesn't even make any sense. I can't stop eating them. It is odd. The concept of a plan. I cracked up yours. It is odd that he doesn't know the difference between an insane asylum and an asylum seeker. That is weird. <clears throat> I agree with you, Liz. That is a strange thing. I love the fact checking though. I was really pleased with how they, I mean, I know a lot of people said they wished there was more fact checking, but I think for a first go of fact-checking him live, I think that that was, I mean, it was a good start as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. I thought, I thought they did a nice job. I was pleased with their work. Um, when she said the government shouldn't have any same woman's body. Yeah, well, obviously. I mean, we all agree with that. There's no, no, um, argument for many of us on that one no they do they have they have a lot to keep up with and i i think um you know live tv is difficult and they want to make sure that they present it properly and i don't blame them for that um but i do love that they were flat they flat out were like you know i just want to say that there is no country in this union where Shmushmortions are possible in the ninth month or after. <laughs> oh yeah, of course it does, Jen. Of course, I agree completely. 
and she mentioned rallies. I was like, oh my gosh, that was so funny, you guys. She was like, let me invite you to my opponent's rally. He can't take it. As Obama said, he has a, an obsession. Listen. Yeah, I was like, bro, do you know what Shmushmortion is called after birth? It's not Shmushmortion anymore, you guys. <laughs> It's not smush motion anymore. <laughs> and it's definitely not legal. And none of us want it. And I will repeat once again, for those in the back, there is not a human living on this planet who carries a baby for nine months for any reason, even if they're planning to give them up for adoption, that wants to end the pregnancy in the nine month. You don't wait until the ninth month to make that decision. No one does that. That's not a thing. Like, there's no point anymore at that point. Like, you're not helping yourself or anyone else. You still have to give birth. Even if you were magically to have a nine month shmushmortion, you'd still have to give birth. Why bother at that point? I mean, it's, it's an insane concept that they, I mean, like, if you guys could take a biology class, maybe we wouldn't have to have this debate. Yeah, see, 192 to 70, it's very good. It's very good numbers. Guys, I'm the worst at math, and even I know that's wrong. That's bad, that's how you know it's bad. If Sasha can't do it, it's bad. I mean, Sasha can do it. Oh God, see, can't even speak. I saw, people do believe it, and it's because we don't have more education, you guys, I will. Exactly what Amanda is saying. I, I, if we weren't stifling education, we wouldn't have this issue. And, and it is the number one reason why I take issue with, like, there are so many people, like, I know so many family members who got out of being religious, but they're still sending their kids to religious schools because they somehow think they're better than public schools. And I'm like, bro, do you not remember what we went through when we were kids? Not my sister, don't worry, it's not Zoe anything. Please, don't even worry about that. She would never, that, the, the, the public school is directly across the street from our school, don't worry about it, you know. So, Zoe and Ethan are safe, they're fine. But like, I have other cousins and things who grew up in the same awful environment we grew up in, and they're still, sending their kids to Christian schools because it's a better education. And I'm like, better in what regard? Can you like, because let me tell you, I went to private Christian schools until I was in high, up until high school. And the amount of catch up I had to do to compete with the other students in high school was vast. I'm just lucky that I am like a self learner and I was able to play catch up. Not every child has that ability and I'm not saying that to brag, I'm just saying it to explain. Like I have a lot of my own neurodivergencies but none of them, God bless, you know, thankfully none of them have manifested in me in learning disabilities. So I am lucky and I know it's luck. I don't think that I was given any kind, like, kind of like, I didn't, <clears throat> there was no, it's just luck. I just happened into this particular brain which has its own issues on another side. But like, there are some kids who would not be able to catch up. Oh, it's totally relatable, Sophie. And so putting them in a school where they're gonna be behind is how we get these people who believe this later. I will stand by that for the rest of my life. You cannot dissuade me on that belief. The reason that these people are able to believe those things is because they did not get proper education early on on certain things because either they were at a religious school or they were indoctrinated or whatever. You know? It's crazy. It's just crazy. Did you guys hear, like, he tried to slip in and she puts out? I heard that. I was like, bro, he said that live on television. He said that live on television and every single maggot's wife is gonna be okay with that. And I was like, bro. He did. It was sly, Claire. It was sly. 
they are two different groups, but the Republicans haven't been helping Amanda. You have to admit that until now. Um, it was so gross. When I can't remember when it was. There's a moment he said, I can't remember what he said, but he finished it up with, and she puts out, I heard that. And it's like, and it was quick. It was sly. And when, like, the moderator must have made a face or something because he went, what? I heard it. Like that. Oh yes, that's right, Sophie. It was around the time when they asked about her race. That's exactly when it was. Yeah, yeah. So he went racist and sexist all in one sentence. Story, bro. I mean, we couldn't see the moderators, but I have to imagine that um, I did. That was amazing, Isa. I'm so glad she did that. She, she deserved to walk up to him and get that handshake. She forced it and it made her look strong. She is strong, she doesn't need to look strong, but you know what I'm saying, it's good for optics. I don't care if she shakes his hand actually, but I am happy for her to look strong on the public stage. You know what I'm saying, you guys, like, I don't, I don't need anything from her as far as optics are concerned, you know what I mean? I, it's not gonna make a difference to me. Oh, I'm sure, Amanda, I can't even imagine. Wild. Anyway, let's get to reading because we do need to read two chapters today, but as per usual, we're all in agreement. There's no, I mean, I don't think anyone here is surprised that we all agree we're a group for a reason. This is our core. You know what I mean? Like, obviously we do this every day. We wouldn't be together every day if we didn't have similar, if not the same ideals. Um, especially because a lot of people let their kids listen to this. Yes, book club has always been a safe space from day one and it will continue to be that way. Um, hey Grace, um, but yeah, I just, uh, I just, it's, it's a good time. Grace, we're about to start reading, so, so tuck in, friendos, tuck in. Um, <laughs> all right, chapter 22. We're getting to the end, you guys, we only have four chapters left. It's very exciting. This guy never skips leg day. Hayden and I gaze up at the statue of Mothman who could cut steel with his abs. I don't know who designed this statue, but I imagine that this is what it was like in the darkest parts of Hayden's brain. For example, the part that I think secretly lusts to get in bed with a cryptid. The statue towers over us like a knight in shiny armor with razor wings and bright red eyes glaring out of her Point Pleasant, West Virginia. I put on my whiteboard today. I have a concept of a plan. Guys, I gotta tell you, I woke up this morning with a concept of a plan for how to do October birthdays. It's not a fully fledged plan, but it's a concept of a plan. I woke up with it. I'm just a genius. Everyone says it. I'm oh, sorry, you guys. I'm basically done. I don't even need to do work anymore. <laughs> The thing has intense abs and pecs, and as I round the statue with the camcorder, I observe the back of the sculpture. He's got an ass that won't quit too, I add, and I cannot believe Scroll is letting us expense a trip to film Mothman's hard steel ass. Hayden joins me behind the statue, and one hand is planted firmly on a cheek. Eh, I think you've seen better, he says. Oh, you're just fishing for compliments now, I say. Well, maybe. A few weeks ago, we would have cut that segment in a heartbeat, and now the secret's out. Our fans know that we're together, and while we haven't outwardly said it ourselves, we're not trying to hide anything, and we appear in each other's social media stories and posts, never minding how close we look, like the occasional comment about what a cute couple we are is just to keep things interesting. So for now, I let the camera linger on Hayden for a moment, capturing his sly smile and raising his eyebrows and soft laugh as he carefully peels his hands off of Mothman's ass. Statements you never think you're gonna hear. Right, babe? What? Did you did you think you'd wake up this morning to hear someone talking about Mothman's ass? Who's Mothman? He's a cryptid. Is he alive? Well we don't know. Is he real? We don't know, babe. Well how are you touching his ass this time? Well it's a statue of him. Mm -hmm. They went to go see a statue. Do you want to tell people about the monsters in the closet? <laughs> 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 I uh I am the Late nineties, which I'm literally called the Mothman. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big thing. Um, well, the movie was not a big thing. No, but the the rumor, the the what is it called? The conspiracy, if you will, is a big thing. It was called the Mothman prophecies. Probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
closet monster. Uh, what's there to say about him? He's, you know, in our closet. Right. He's right next to our bed. Right, it's bad. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the way you go to bed at night, he makes noises. <laughs> um, it's true. But we don't investigate. No, of course not. We're not crazy. Yes, we're not crazy. Yeah, I mean, we might be crazy for other reasons, but definitely not that kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah something's in there, banging around. <laughs> okay, Hayden, no worries. <laughs> <clears throat> See, you're not mad at me, he taunts with a smirk. I've suppressed most of my memories from our camping escapades last night, and I shoved my bug bites and feelings of blades of grass stuck to the back of me into the bowels of my brain with the part in Pinocchio where they turn into donkeys. It is a pretty scary part of Pinocchio when they turn into donkeys. When you're a kid, that's really scary. Yeah. Did that scare you? It scared me. Um, I don't think I saw it young enough to be scared. Oh, I did. <clears throat> and I was scared. Yeah. Was anyone else scared by the donkey scene in Pinocchio? Because... What year was Pinocchio made? Like, 1956. Okay. So, like, way before our existence. My yeah. mom was barely alive. Yeah. Well, she was, like, eight. Um, the whale didn't scare me as much as the donkey scene. Maybe it's because I knew Jonah got swallowed by a whale and he made it out okay, so I figured everything was going to be fine. It's true. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Yeah. Uh, what? Like Jonah. Jonah. Jonah and the whale. Like that drawing my mom made when she was a kid. Looks more like a dolphin, but you know, you do you. All the grades. <laughs> She's not an artiste. She is a doctor. The horror of peeing in the woods will live with me until I die, but at least I didn't need to use a leaf. We did Should not- she use a funnel? Maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess so, Jen. We did not find Mothman, but I didn't hate being in the woods as much this time. Hayden's an alarmingly good camper and he can cook on a little fire that he builds himself and he knows how to make sleeping bags comfortable. I feel fairly certain that he would fight a bear for me and a few doses of tent beep boop didn't hurt either. No, I agree. I'm not mad, but I am making you promise right here on film that you will not make me go camping until at least halfway through the next season. Please, I'm begging you, we've had enough. Okay, well, so there goes my hopes of the Skunk Ape episode in the first half of the season. Yes, I banished those hopes into the Bermuda Triangle. Thank you. Oh, back to the drawing board now. He continues, slipping back into his narrator voice. I steady the camera on him. <clears throat> Mothman is an omen of doom. His appearance has preceded many catastrophes from the Silver Bridge collapse in 1967 to Chernobyl to 9-11. Ooh, too timely. Whoa. Chernobyl? You're trying to say that Mothman caused Chernobyl? What did he do? Hit the nuclear reactor button with his big ass? No, he warned them and they didn't listen. Are we in danger by being this close to him? Hayden shakes his head with a steadfast confidence. No, no, this is a tourist attraction, not the real thing. You know, I think we need to come back in September and come to the Mothman festival. It's a whole festival, a whole festival, Hallie. I could die at the way he practically bounces on his toes in excitement over the prospect of a Mothman festival. It's like Coachella for conspiracy theorists. I don't know if there's enough of us for us to do in West Virginia to warrant coming twice in one year. That's only like three months away. We can hunt flatwood monsters too. What about the not deer? I stop recording and hang the camera strap over my shoulder. Hayden's smile grows and his fingers grasp around mine as we slowly fold together, shielded by Mothman's washboard abs and juicy ass. After spending the night in the woods, we checked into our hotel and quickly showered, but Hayden still smells like crisp pine and fresh air with hints of lemon verbena shampoo. Are you ready to eat pizza with Mothman on it? He says this like it's supposed to turn me on or something. I nod, I'm sure, but I'm not nearly as ready as you are. He pulls away, offering me a hand as we move through the center of town towards the pizza place. And as we wait at the crosswalk, my phone buzzes and I extract it from my pocket. One notification jumps out amidst many social media comments and likes. Nora, 2.15 PM. Have you seen this? I want to eat this man to eat shit and die, 2.16. He starts talking shit at six minutes in. Oh boy, here we go. I hover over the link that she sent me in our chain and I click on it and I know right away it's not going to be good news. What the Fox, episode 321, with special guest, Kate Browning. 
Fox Evans is Cade's knockoff Joe Rogan, former roommate from college who has hit it surprisingly big with a fuckboy podcast crowd. Against all better judgment, I press, press play right in the middle of the square. <clears throat> Fox Evans. And this is a competition, so like, I need you to win. Everyone listening, listen, he needs to win. None of the other shows competing are even on his level. Not even one of them. Cade Browning. Yeah, there are some really odd shows in this lineup. By now, Hayden swung back to me, listening in too. He asked quietly, Cade? And I nod before it continues, Fox Evans. I couldn't help but notice a particular ex-girlfriend of yours is also working on a show in this competition. Cade, yeah, Fox. What's up with that anyway? Cade, well, it's a free country. She wasn't right for newbie brothers. Fox. Yeah, she's got some features none of the other brothers have, if you know what I mean. When I look back up at Hayden, he has his eyes drawn behind his head. His green eyes stormy. He has his hands drawn behind his head. His green eyes are stormy and furious beneath the lenses of his glasses. Cade chuckles. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't want to say it because I don't want to sound like a dick. Fox. You don't come on what the fox to sound like a nice guy. There's so few spaces left for men to just be themselves anymore. Cade, fine, all right, well, I mean, like, she's not the cute bubbly girl that she seems like she is on camera. Like, trust me, I know her quite well off camera. People love her, but they don't know her. I have no control how she behaves anymore. Fox, now, I don't wanna poke the bear here or anything, but I was looking at some numbers, and for some reason, her show is averaging a higher viewership than yours. Cade, yep. Fox, how come? I mean, look, it's a show about freaking ghost hunting. Cade. Mm, yep, can't forget looking for the Loch Ness Monster. Both laugh. Cade, she randomly found this guy, Fox, from like the bowels of Reddit or something. Cade, or his mom's basement. Hayden sits down beside me on one of the benches and rests a hand on my leg. I think of a childhood full of bullying and how hard it must be to hear someone dragging his name through the mud, so I pause the video. We don't have to keep listening, I choke. My eyes are burning, and as much as what Kate is saying is child's play compared to what he said to me in private, so many other people are gonna hear this one. So many other people will eat up whatever he says, like I did for years. Hayden shakes his head, and his voice comes out icy cold. It's up to you. I don't care what he says about me. So I press play again. Fox. I feel like I can't even articulate how bizarre and embarrassing their show is. Let me just play a clip for everyone listening. Clip of The Out There, episode six. Hallie, what if, what if that Bigfoot burger you're eating is made from actual Bigfoot meat? Hayden, it obviously isn't. That would imply someone found and caught a Bigfoot and carved it for serving. Hallie, it'd be a shame to shove Big th through a meat grinder, but I do have a question. Hayden, shoot, how come no one has ever found Bigfoot's skeleton? Hayden, well, there have been a few people who claim that they found one or killed one, but none have proven to be real. There are always these sketchy guys who say things like, well, I can't tell you where it is, but I do have it. Hallie, oh yeah, that's not sketchy at all. Hayden, I know, says another sketchy guy. Both laugh. Yeah, Hallie, so Bigfoot's immortal then. Hayden, I don't know, anything's possible. Hallie, right, it's out there. So how's the burger? Hayden, honestly, it's kind of dry. Beat, Fox Evans. You see what I mean? Okay, dude, you don't gotta tell me. Whatever she can do for attention though, I guess, it's just what she does. She's so insecure that she needs someone to be tooting her horn all the time. She's needy, clingy, and if she didn't sleep with all her coworkers, she'd be out of a job. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You wanna think that this is fiction, and then you watch the debate live on national television and it sounds oddly similar. So weird, same quote, twice in two days. People are gonna read this scene. No, let me refresh. No one's gonna read this and disagree with it because she has the correct audience. <laughs> but if bros read this, they would think that this was very fictional because they didn't pay attention. This is not fictional. Fox Evans, shit, is that true? Kate, yeah, she's two for two that I know of. Fox Evans, this guy too? Kate, yeah, it came out a few weeks ago that they're together. She's clearly using him and it's really upsetting that she'd want to do another person like that just to make their mark. Fox, match made in weirdo heaven if you ask me. You know, that's why you can't trust women like her. You want to believe they're being genuine and kind, but then they pull shit like this and they try to make us look bad. You know there's a name for girls like her. We can't say it on the show, but there is a name. Kate laughs. Yep. 
If you get taken off the air, you'll never get to have me back. I close the episode with shaking fingers and I feel like I'm going to be sick. I don't want to look at Hayden and the face that maybe this time he's making when he hears Cade say it and maybe he'll buy what he's saying this time. But one peek at him tells me he won't buy it. His hands are balled into a fist against his jeans and his jaw is tight into a straight line. That should bring me comfort enough, but it doesn't. Not now. More notifications buzz at my phone, responses to my latest post from earlier this morning, a photo of me frowning at our collapsed tent after I tried to disassemble it, and I start to read. The earlier comments were punny jokes and quips and the occasional serious conspiracy theorist telling me that the reason we didn't find Mothman was because we weren't deep woodsing it enough, which I will never be doing. Now the conversation has shifted. Do you really think she's just dating him for the attention, like to get on the show? No, oh, I really hope not. Hayden deserves better than to get played by some bitch. Don't care. Two for two on sleeping with her coworkers is a low. And why no one, that's why no one roots for women to succeed. I'm done watching this show now. Yeah, I think I'm out too. Before I can read any more, Hayden rests a hand on the top of mine and nudges me to put my phone down. I always knew the risks of stepping into the spotlight. The hammer will always come down harder on a woman than it will on a man. So any step out of line I took would be meant with vitriol and angry virtual pitchforks. I know that there are people who don't like me or maybe who find me annoying, but they seem to be a small minority that I can easily ignore with so many of our fans flooding our comments with love. I spent months disapproving all, disproving all the conspiracy theories that Cade spread about me and let it fester inside my brain only for him to throw the evidence back in my face, only for him to find some way to sabotage my hard work at the finish line. With each negative comment that pops up on the screen, I know one other person is believing him and turning our fans against us. All because I fell in love with the wrong person and then because I fell in love with the right person and I knew better. I knew better than to be fearless and blaze my own path. I knew better than to claim any space and be seen. I look up at Mothman and his titanium jacked body stares back down at me. Who the fuck made this statue? Mothman has abs and a tight ass. Mothman goes to CrossFit. Mothman flips tires for fun. An omen of doom is fucking right. I stand and before I can break down in front of a nice little family trying to take pictures with Mothman, I flee. Hayden follows close behind me, guiding me back to our rental car, and we arrive at the gray sedan that smells like smoke and stale french fries. And Hayden quickly opens the back door and I realize what he's doing. I slide into the back seat with him and as soon as the door slams behind him, I give in to the tears. Hayden sweeps me up into his arms and his lap and holds on to me like it's his personal responsibility to keep me from falling apart. And I cry into his jacket, hot tears sliding off the waterproof windbreaker fabric in broken, heaving sobs that won't stop until I feel like I can't breathe anymore. Hey, look, it's okay, Hayden whispers. I promise it's gonna be okay. But I struggle to believe him. I don't struggle to believe that other people will take Cade's word at face value. If our fans turn against me, it'll run me out there into the ground. And it's only been a few hours and the Scroll fans have already gotten wind of this. We got cocky, we showed our hands, and Cade retaliated. He knows he's going to lose, so he did whatever he could to hurt us. To hurt me. No, to punish me for being brave enough to tell him no time and time again. It scares me the most that even now, when I have someone who cares for me so unconditionally, a job that makes me excited to go to work, fans who hang on everything we say and post, who tell us every week how happy our show makes them, I might never be free of the scars that Cade left behind. Hayden's grip tightens on my jacket like he's restraining himself from acting out, and I suddenly wish he had punched Cade back at the scroll party. It made Cade's retaliation worse, but at least he'd have a fucked up nose or something like that to make me feel better. I follow Hayden's breathing and though it's heavy and angry to calm myself, I follow Hayden's breathing though it's heavy and angry to calm myself enough to wipe my eyes and talk and put the pain into words. Wait, oh, sorry, Ray. Um, Cade went on a, uh, a, a basically like a bro Rogan kind of talk show and slammed her and their show or whatever, which is not cute. Hmm. He brushes my tears away with his thumb and hangs onto me tighter. What do you want me to do? He finally says, what? What do you want me to do? I don't know. He starts and his voice is slipping into a frantic ramble. I mean, like I could, I don't know, I could sue him if you want. He used a clip of our show without permission or like, I don't know, I don't like resorting to violence, but I could, I could punch him if you asked me to. And you don't have to do anything. It's not the answer he wants because He's restrained himself from fighting me on it. 
You don't. It won't make a difference. He did this because we make him look bad and that's because we're going to win. Going to. Now if our views tank because our viewers hate me, they think I'm using Hayden for attention or believe that I don't love him with everything I have, Scroll could change their mind. I'd be a liability then for them to keep around. Listen, I don't want this asshole to get away with this, Hallie. He can't just go around saying things like that about us, about you. It's not true and he can't just do that. He does whatever he wants and he never pays for it. He never sees consequences for a single fucking thing that he does in his life, Hayden. Whatever we say, he's gonna spin it to make it about us. This is how, this is how I stayed for so long is what I want to say, because I'm terrified of stepping out of line and being seen, a fear that didn't exist before Cade and I just wish it didn't exist after Cade either. All right. He breathes, leaning his head back against the seat. His eyes flutter shut and he rubs the bridge of his nose under his glasses before returning to me. He wipes away the remaining tears on my cheek and presses a kiss against the side of my head. Then what can I do for you? I just wanna go back to the hotel. Hayden slips out from under me and we climb into the front seat, driving back to our hotel room. It's hardly a refuge, full of concerning colored comforters and even scarier carpet, but at least it's not a tent in the middle of the woods. The mosquitoes are far less bountiful in here. And since we missed our chance at Mothman Pizza, Hayden disappears to find food for us once he knows that I'm okay. With him gone, I slide my phone out again and continue to read the comments that flood in. Cage shares the podcast episode and the quotes on his page about eliminating toxic people from your lives, and the comments are full of supportive fans telling him to keep his chin up, ignore me and my negativity. And good for him for overcoming? We don't talk about how women hurt men enough? I move to Hayden's profile and find a picture of the two of us together. There are so many new comments, like people desperate to swarm in and tell him he's better off without me. And I wonder if his bu phone is buzzing constantly too. I wonder if he's reading any of this and what's going on inside his head if he is. I know it won't do me any favors to look at the comments. For every loving fan, I'm afraid there's 10 more troll termites that'll crawl out of the woodwork for me. When I first discovered Hayden on the out there, the entire point was to make it about him. He was gonna be my show and I was gonna guide him on the path to success. I was never supposed to share the spotlight and now I do. And it could be the downfall of years and years of work. I set the phone aside as the hotel room door opens again and he steps in holding a pizza box in one hand and a bottle of wine in the other. He slips off his hiking boots and jacket and places the pizza between us on the bed. I can't help but smile because I already know what's inside. This asshole is not going to keep us from our Mothman pizza, he says, pouring a glass of wine for each of us into the flimsy plastic hotel cups. I sip at it, but wine out of a plastic cup tastes far worse. It's just science, not a conspiracy theory. Regardless though, I'm gonna drink all of it. Hayden leans over the side of the bed, grabbing my phone off the nightstand and placing it on, placing it on silent beside his on the other side of the room. There's a digital storm brewing for both of us, but he's trying to make it a safe shelter as, he, as much as he can. He'll board up the windows and doors to keep anything that might knock me down or sweep me away at bay if he has to. I can only give him a weak shake of my head and he flips open the pizza box and I know I'm not the expert in the room, but this really doesn't look anything like Mothman. Mothman is staring back at me with weird little tomatoey eyes and a pepperoni body and an ungodly amount of mushrooms for wings and scrawny bell pepper legs. And I don't know if I prefer this Mothman or the bootylicious one in town square. I'll let you take the first piece. My hero, I tease and claim one of Mothman's legs, which seems to somewhat have a proportionate amount of pepperoni and bell pepper. It's not a New York slice by any means, but I guess it's the thought that counts. Hayden claims a more mushroomy smothered piece and we dig in and eat in silence for a few minutes. With half the bottle of wine and an inconsistent half of Mothman's body gone too quickly, both of our phone screens keep lighting up across the room and it's painful not knowing what everyone is saying about it. But watching our follower count drop and notifications rise, DMs filling up because one person wields so much power hurts more than holding back. Hallie, don't pay them any mind. Hey, Brittany. Please don't. Are people spamming you too? He nods. Yeah. With what? Does it matter? No matter what we do, there are going to be people who have nothing good to say. I've been doing this long enough to sure. But what happens when this bullshit ruins our chances of winning? What happens when I'm too much trouble for you to work with? His eyes soften and he sits up, our knees brushing against each other. And he takes my hand in his. I stroke the outline of the UFO tattoo on his wrist, pushing the band of his watch out of the way. I think this might be the closest 
I come to believing in aliens, but at least I thought maybe I was starting to believe in myself again. I've spent the past five years talking about Bigfoot and aliens and the time that the US government researched astral projections and found monsters and was like, well, fuck that. People are constantly picking fights with me online and I have plenty of enemies in the conspiracy theory community too. It's a super weird community. Yeah, it sure is. But I don't listen to them and they don't get to tell me what to do. People are constantly telling me, I'm an idiot. You included. He tilts my chin up with a smile. Remember what I said that first day when we hung out at my apartment? My eyes widen. Hayden, you gave me an entire PowerPoint presentation. You need to be more specific. That some people just believe what they're told and others don't. Yeah, we've already established I'm not really a conspiracy theorist. I thought you knew that about me. Hayden wipes my eyes as another flood of tears drips down my cheeks. I know that very well, non-believer. But what I'm trying to say is that for this moment, it might help you to be a little out there like me. Why? Because there's no reason you should listen to what this jerk off says. Just because he says it doesn't make it true. You can choose not to believe in him just like you don't believe in Bigfoot or aliens or Mothman. Ouch, he hisses. In his own hometown, you're gonna talk like that? No mercy for Mothman. See, he laughs. It's not that easy. I wish I could just brush what Cade says off so easily it'll be harder now that he's got more people who believe in him. My phone continues to flash with a cascade of new notifications. I'm afraid what everyone will say. He draws me back into him. I know it's not, but I don't want you to think about Cade. I don't want him to get a second more of your brain power because he doesn't deserve it. He used your brilliance enough and we created something amazing together. And there are always gonna be naysayers who quickly jump on a holier than thou attitude, but there are always gonna be people who love what you bring to the show too. I love what you bring to the show. The more I think about it, stepping in front of the camera and the more I, my stomach churns, I wanna keep hunting monsters I don't believe in with someone I do believe in for as long as I can. I wanna follow Hayden into the woods and complain the whole time and jab at his theories until he sounds like he belongs on The Departed and watch our success grow and know that we did it together. But with each win, I'm terrified that Cade, uh, I'm terrified Cade and the fears he's planted will be right behind us dragging me, no, dragging us down. And Hayden deserves more than that. I think I do too, but it seems like only the ghosts I do believe in the only ghosts I do believe in are my doubts looming over my shoulder and keeping my worth shoved down so far that I don't know how to show it off. I can't imagine Hayden following Hayden out to Area 51 and hunting for aliens, pretending everything is fine, like I'm some brave girl who stands up to him all the time, who takes no shit. I thought I was that girl. I've just been reminded that I'm not all the way there yet and healing isn't always linear. It's a full Bermuda Triangle, wormholes, portals that I can't explain, this is one of those times. And all I can do is hope that I'm one of those cases where there are answers on the other side. But for now, my brain just feels like a series of unhinged conspiracy theories, and I'm not sure which one of them is true. I turn off my phone and Hayden ignores his. While the buzzing stops, I don't see the speculation and fights in the comments, but I know they are happening. I know Hayden's fully aware of it too. And before we take off to return to LA, he confirms that people are indeed still talking about it. He confirms that Cade is still fueling the fire, leaving cryptic, cryptic comment responses on posts, liking posts tagged with hashtag the out there is over party, asserting to his haters and the people that would change their mind if they knew what I was really like. As always, Cade chooses the right weapons to fight with. The flight back to LA is actually kind of nice because neither of us can focus on the comments and spiraling going online. For a few hours, it's like, it's not even happening. The plane lands and Hayden reaches for my hand. Our fingers weave together and he keeps me as close as he can while we wait for our bags and wandering eyes catch, as wandering eyes catch us with a sense of vague familiarity around the airport. We're not A-listers by any means, but we do get recognized as a, is it not that person from the internet kind of way? None of it makes Hayden pull away though. Nothing I've said or done can make him back away from what we've built together. So why do I want to run away so badly? He does what he can to cheer me up and buys me a coffee at the Dunkin' in the airport because that might be the way to his heart. And he puts a particularly ridiculous podcast episode on about the fact or fiction on certain internet creepypastas uh, in the car and feigns rolling his eyes to just engage with me. When we arrive back at Hayden's apartment, Cthulhu comes bounding toward the door, flopping over and demanding belly rubs and treats. Oh, no, Mr. Chunks. He coos at Cthulhu. I know, I know, you want snacks. Cthulhu trots behind Hayden as he opens the treat jar and nibbles at them for a few seconds before turning to give me a wary slow blink. 
Slogan means trust, Hayden whispers. He looks like he's going to eat me. I set my bag down on the couch as Cthulhu waddles over to me and rubs his head against my leggings. Cthulhu and I have a tenuous relationship. He doesn't attack me per se, but he will nudge me out of the way to snuggle with Hayden and to prove that he is his human, not mine. See, Hayden says, and I bend down and rub the back of the cat's head. And for the first time since I've known him, he purrs. Much like the rest of Hayden's apartment, this has become a home. I spend most nights here, have a half drawer in his dresser for pajamas and a toothbrush and a spare change of clothes for when I do stay over. I live on Hayden's couch with my laptop among a sea of his weird conspiracy encrypted books. And when I stepped in just now, it felt like falling into the world's softest bed. Do you want to hang out for a bit? We can order takeout and then take it easy before hitting the ground running on the finale tomorrow. He's already rifling through the menus in one of his kitchen drawers and I feel like I'm walking on thin ice again and I'm about to shatter. Hey, no, what's up? I just, maybe it's not a good idea for me to be in the finale. I've been dreading saying those words, but I kept thinking it's what's best for both of us. There'll be no victory of beating Cade like I want. There'll be no hunting for aliens in the middle of the desert with my favorite person. But if I know Cade, as long as he has a platform, as long as he has scroll backing him, he's not gonna stop making my life a living hell. For years, I gave in because it was just easier and I hate that I'm gonna do it again, but I don't know what other choices I have. I don't feel brave enough to choose anything. What? Why would you, Hallie? That's like saying, what if we made the X-Files, but there's no Scully in it? He crosses his arms in front of his chest. And to be fair, they did have episodes like that, but they're none of my favorite episodes. I know, it's not what you want to hear, but I think it, with all this stuff going on, with all the hate and attention, maybe it's better if you just do the finale alone. The more I poke the bear, the worse it's going to get, and it could jeopardize your chances of getting a season two. I'm supposed to be the one pulling the strings to make the magic happen, not the reason that you fail. Hayden thinks this over and his Adam's apple bobs up and down, jaw tightening. You do realize the show wouldn't exist if you hadn't stepped into co-host, right? Like we wouldn't have even gotten a full season if it was just me and you know that, trust me, I know that. And then that, that was then and this is now. Circumstances change. Hayden, there are a shitload of our viewers who think I'm using you for attention and that I don't really care about you or the show. Well, if they take the word of some asshole on a podcast so easily, then I don't want them. We're better off without them. The bad part is that Scroll's competition we've chosen as our battleground in this, the numbers do matter. We stand in silence, our arms folded across from one another in the kitchen, so no sound but the hum of the refrigerator and Cthulhu chasing a piece of kibble around the floor comes out. This is exactly what he wants, Hayden finally says. You do realize that, right? He wants you to back away because he's threatened by how great you are and he knows that he doesn't stand a chance on his own. And if you walk away from the last episode, we're just handing him a victory because I, on my own, am nowhere near as what near what I am when I'm with you to bounce off of. And I don't wanna do this without you, so please don't make me do this without you. I struggle to swallow my tears and I am so goddamn tired of crying. I'm scared. That's why I want to back away. Cade's gonna do whatever he can to make sure that everyone in the world sees me the way he does, our fans and you. His eyes flicker up to mine and he shakes his head. I could never. Yeah, I might seem brave, but I'm not jumping at every breeze in the haunted hotel room like, no, sorry. I might seem brave, but I'm not jumping at every breeze in a haunted hotel room. What? I don't understand, hold on, I lost something here. Want me to read it? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who's talking. Oh. Okay, I got it. It's Hallie. I might seem brave. I'm not jumping at every breeze in the hotel room that's haunted like you are, Hayden frowns to himself, or worried about getting eaten by Bigfoot, but I'm not really brave. I let someone push me around and belittle me for years because I was just too scared to leave and risk the consequences. Yeah, but you did leave and I'm still paying for it. I know what it takes to stand up for myself like this and Hayden, I just don't know if I have it in me to do it right now. I'm trying my damn best to heal and you have no idea how much you've helped with that. You have, but I don't know if this is the best way to do it right now. I'm so sorry to disappoint you, but this has all been a lot and I need a little bit of time. Hayden watches me for a second before scrubbing his hands over his face and sighing and I sniffle away my tears the bottom of, with the bottom of my sleeve before reaching for my duffel bag again. And as my hand curls around the doorknob, he speaks up. Hallie, before you go, can I just say something? I turn and nod. Yeah, sure. 
He thinks over his words carefully and I recognize the nervous, uncertain person he is now from our first day working together. I think of all the ways that we've made progress together. I've let myself love someone when I swore I never would again and I stand in confidence next to him knowing that I can say what I wanna to say to him and he's gonna listen or playfully argue and then volley my nonsense right back at me. He lets people see his worst days. He doesn't hide the daily pill organizer of antidepressants anymore or come up with a lie when I can tell he's stuck inside his own head. I don't want either of us to lose that progress but I do already have one foot out the door. I only know half of what Cade put you through and I can't imagine the pain that he's caused. And God, look, I wish I could take it away, but I can't. I can only do the best with my power. And I know how hard it is to let people see you. Trust me, I know that. I spent three years completely alone because I didn't want to show all the ways that I was broken. All I can tell you is that being alone sucks. And I know it's not the answer, even if it seems like it's the easiest thing to do but I really don't want to see you take what he says to heart. Not when we're so close, not when we have thousands of fans who love us and who want seasons and seasons of us being stupid on the internet. And especially not when he's wrong about everything he says about you. Not all of it is wrong, I choke out. I did very much so date the last two people that I worked closely with. Hayden cracks a smile that makes the tears in his eye fade away. Bear, with the rest of it, he's completely wrong. You're not hard to work with or hard to love. Loving you has been the easiest thing I've ever done. Our eyes meet and I can hardly see him through the sheen of tears blurring my vision. I can only gather the tight, nervous composure and tension in his body, the dorky Bigfoot t-shirt that he's wearing and the red flannel over his shoulders, but I know him well enough to fill in the gaps. I know the heavy fear that's weighing down the lightest green in his eyes, and the shake that he has in his hands, because being this open terrifies him more than our brushes with ghosts even do but I also know the slight nod of his head tells me that he means everything he's said. And the truth is that he does love me. He loves me easily, happily, and completely, just like I feel for him too. What? I ask, even though it's a stupid question. I heard him loud and clear. I love you so much, non-believer, and you should know that all the ridiculous conspiracy theories and monsters I believe in, yeah, I believe in you the most. His chest heaves and he breathes, just like he's a second away from breaking down and begging me to stay. I don't want to do a single second to be out there without you. It's you and me now, Hal. Whether you believe it or not, you're the magic that's always been missing and anyone with two brain cells can see that. Even Cade does because otherwise he wouldn't be having a hissy fit that he's having right now. It takes a lot of bravery even to even live through what Cade's done to you. It takes even more to walk away from it and forge your own path without him. You've done it and you've done both. Don't underestimate yourself for even a minute. I know that no matter what, you have me in your corner. But more importantly than what I want is I want you to feel safe and supported. So if you're scared of what Cade will do, what our viewers will say, and you don't feel comfortable finishing the season, fine. If it's gonna do nothing but hurt you and if you need to step away for a bit, then I guess that is what I want you to do. Hey, Dan. I mean it, he says, and I know he does, really. And I won't change, it won't change how I feel about you. But how could it not change how he feels? In a few weeks after I sit out this episode and Scroll makes their choice, it's likely that there won't be any more the out there. Not the one that Hayden and I knew. He might go back to podcasting or start something new, but I chose him and I got him to put his trust in me and it feels unforgivable to let him down like this. All because I'm not brave enough to believe in myself and drown out the skeptics. I don't hear Hayden cross the room and approach me, but he draws his hands to the side of my face and wipes away my tears again. It only makes the tears come harder and I crumble into his chest. His shirt still has the faint tinge of the airplane on it, but his hair smells like lemon verbena, and I'm convinced he's carrying extra hotel freebies around everywhere with him to prove a point. He holds onto me tightly, one hand woven into my hair and the other tucking me snugly against his chest. So warm, so safe, and so loving, but I wish it was enough to give me that last kick of bravery that I need to pick happiness over everything else. It's okay. I want you to do whatever it is you need to do to take care of yourself. Hayden tilts my head out of his chest and brushes his thumb along the curve of my lip, even if that means backing away and taking the time you need. I'll be here for you whenever you need. I lean into him and slide my arms around his shoulders, meeting him at his lips. He makes it easy to love him and he makes me so unafraid to be loved, but right now, kissing him feels like he's pleading for me not to leave, which I can't promise. He clutches my shirt and pulls me tight against his body and I run my hands up his chest, tracing the tattoos that I know are underneath his shirt and bite down on his lip in a way that makes him sigh and hold me tighter. Hey, I love you, he repeats. Just tell me what you need from me. I know I could tell him that I love him too, but I've always wanted to be 
to, I've always wanted it to be at the right moment. I wanted it to come when it felt like a celebration instead of a goodbye. So I keep that to myself for now. I pull away brushing the curves of his cheek. Right now, I need some time to think this over and process the last couple of days. Hayden lets go of me and nods. All right, of course. I break away before I convince myself to do something I'm not ready for and grab my bag. I give Cthulhu a pat on the head before heading to the door. Hey, Holly, Hayden adds and wipes his eyes beneath his glasses, sniffing away the rest of his tears. Don't be a cryptid. People should see you. And God knows we have enough cryptid hunting work ahead of us. Don't make our jobs any harder than it already is. He finishes that with a soft smile that makes me feel like it'll be okay. It's a sliver of light that I can hang on to as I walk away and try to figure out what I'm supposed to do next. Sad. Uh -uh. I don't know how she's gonna wrap this all up. Jeez Louise, we're almost done. Whoa, wild times. I know, right? What a jerk wad. We hate Cade. Just... Swift kick to the nuts for that guy. All right, I'm gonna go have breakfast, pack up all the orders from last night and uh, get those off to the post office. If anyone has been on the edge about joining Patreon today is the last day to join grab bag on Patreon and get your slime shipped out today for this is all for September Patreon memberships go on pause tomorrow and no, no new people will be able to join until part of the way into October. So if you want it, now's the time and, um, and, and what else? And that's kind of the whole kit and caboodle. I will probably be on later to make some stuff. I'm not sure what yet though. And I will see you all. On the flip side, I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll be back tomorrow morning for the rest of this.